Hello, it's David at DCES UK, and I was going to make today a video about the changes in Amendment 2 to the 18th edition of the IET wiring regulations. But every other electrical channel and their dog seems to have put something out in the time that has passed since the brown books landed at the end of March. So uh, it's not that I'm fashionably late to the party, not that the party has already happened without me, nobody noticed or cared. And I've now turned up, only to find everyone else has gone home. The host is cleaning up discarded beer cans through the fog of an ugly hangover, and I'm being handed a mop and told to clean all the sick from off the bathroom floor. Or something like that, anyway. So, you don't need me to go repeating what everybody else has already said on the issue, do you? You're not going to make me go through with this, are you? There's going to be about 12,000 words on this fucking thing. Fine. The delay in me getting my take on the subject out into the wild is both down to the new books being released on a Monday when I have a day job to do, and because producing all the visual aids needed for this nonsense is time consuming, as I have a day job to do. I've also not had the time to watch anyone else's videos or webinars yet, except for a quick helpful CPD accredited NIC webinar that covered the headlines. As I've said in the past, the way I like to approach new regs books is to go through them fully with my highlighter, underlining the points I find interesting, the things I've forgotten about, and the stuff that's changed or is wholly new. I find an almost page for page comparison between the outgoing book and the shiny new tome helps me to process what's different and how it's going to affect the handful of hours in the day that I call my sobriety time. And a heads up for any newbies watching this who are moving to a new book for the first time, a line to the right of a passage or sentence means something has changed since the prior publication. It may be something that's been removed, rewritten, modified, is completely new, or is even just tweaked in a minor way such as the removal of an erroneous comma or the capitalization of a letter. Look for the line if you want to more easily spot what the new book's got. You should see this presentation more as an opinion piece based on my observations having now read through it, as opposed to a factual video covering in detail all the changes. This is just me rattling through the thing and there might be items I interpret incorrectly, opinions others have perhaps already aired or papooed, and stuff that you might want to chime in on in the comments. It's going to be a very wordy piece so make sure you've had a big wee wee and you've got a good bottle of plonk to hand. What I'm interested in here is the headline stuff that's going to affect my own working day or possibly piss me right off. I'll confess, this probably isn't going to be a rant exercise and straight IET slag off a thon. Oh. I know, I'm sorry to disappoint. It's just that there are things to like about this amendment, things that perhaps indicate common sense may be creeping in at IET mansions. A glimmer of hope that a spark of thought has started to be applied on how this fucking thing plays out for those of us on the front line. You know, I reckon the old farts may even have hired a woman into the ranks who has perhaps thrown some reason among the starched shirts. Let's refer to her as... Samira, because if they're ticking one box, they're probably ticking another. There is still some nonsense in here to cover, but enough of all this further ado. Let's slide a wet finger between the brown flaps of this thing and all the way up to the knuckle. <laughs> of significance at the start of the brown book is the change to the notice from the health and safety executive, which previously hadn't been altered for years. This is in belated response to the arguably careless damage caused by 17th edition Amendment 3 back in 2015, which pulled the plug on plastic enclosures in domestic installations in Regulation 421.1.201 and required any new designs to use metal enclosures from January 2016 onwards. All well and good, but the yellow book didn't make it clear enough that this wasn't to be used to give free licence to dickheads and chancers to go telling anyone with a plastic enclosure that it no longer complied with the current regs, or that it was even illegal. 
or some such similar bullshit, either because such Muppets were ignorant of their duty when performing inspection and testing on existing installations, or because they just liked ripping off old ladies and working stiffs in order to pocket more money. As I've discussed at length in previous videos and in articles on my website, a change in the wiring regulations is not, and never has been, retrospective. Changes apply from the point of publication forward with generally a six month window allowing works in progress to be completed to the previous edition or amendment as designed. Until now, the HSE notice has always addressed this, albeit in the kind of language that sets most people's eyes rolling, if not glazing over. Existing installations may have been designed and installed to conform to the standards set by earlier editions of BS 7671 or the IET wiring regulations. This does not mean that they will fail to achieve conformity with the relevant parts of the Electricity at Work Regulations 1989. This notice means that the HSC and the statutory requirements of EAWR recognise that there would be existing installations which wouldn't meet the letter of the new regulations. However, that never meant such installations were no longer safe for continued use. You could pass an older installation when performing a condition report even if it didn't meet the updated criteria you were inspecting and testing to on the day. Non-compliances may be awarded an advisory improvement recommended, but nothing should be deemed as outright unsafe and requiring replacement, unless something was demonstrably unsafe and required replacement. Rather depressingly, I've been contacted by many people since 2016 seeking advice after being told they now have to fork out for a new consume unit by some fucking idiot who has undertaken an inspection with the intent of automatically failing anything that wasn't installed yesterday. Perhaps recognising the trouble led cause, the IET attempted to address the damage such cowboys were inflicting on the good name of the industry in the release of 18th edition by introducing a new note in chapter 65 for periodic inspection and testing. Regulation 651.2 in the blue book, updated from what had been 621.2 in the yellow book, appeared in 2018 and states under note 2, existing installations may have been designed and installed to conform to previous editions of BS 7671 applicable at the time of their design and erection. This does not necessarily mean that they are unsafe. So as of 2018, when 18th edition came out, the intent of this regulation has been that older installations may not meet the letter of 18th edition when inspected and tested, but 18th edition recognises their right to exist, so long as they're not deemed to be unsafe. Plastic consumer units are not inherently unsafe in of themselves. An inspector should only code them as being unsafe if there's a good reason, such as demonstrable damage, incorrect parts, foreign ingress, substandard workmanship, or whatever. Then, in 2020, the government brought in the new landlord PRS rules for England and Wales, introduced with the typical ineptitude of Boris the Pig and his wider entourage of useless pricks. The published PRS guidance seemed to indicate rental properties must always meet the standards of the day, as it read, Landlords of privately rented accommodation must ensure national standards for electrical safety are met. These are set out in the 18th edition of the Wiring Regulations, which are published as British Standard 7671. This meant every asshole, chancer and checker trade wanker again went out and demanded landlords pay them to rip out anything that hadn't been freshly installed in their tenanted properties only yesterday. Had they bothered to read the PRS guidance a few pages further, they would have seen that it went on to say, existing installations that have been installed in accordance with earlier editions of the wiring regulations may not comply with the 18th edition in every respect. This does not necessarily mean that they are unsafe for continued use or require upgrading. That passage, incidentally, also appears verbatim at the start of every regs book in the introduction section. You can find it on page 4 of today's Brown book. You can also find it largely repeated on page 8, which says this new amendment applies to the design of new installations, additions and alterations, and not to existing installations. If it's not clear by now to anyone undertaking inspection and testing that the regulations of today do not have to apply to the installations that existed before today, then they're not competent to be performing inspection and testing work in the first place. Any fucknugget who can't process that basic fact 
is surely cocking up a thousand and three other things that they haven't looked up or figured out as they go about pretending to be a bona fide electrical inspector. But for any doubters, and to finally stagger to the point, the health and safety executive have since been woken from their long slumber and have clarified where installers and inspectors sit with relation to these statutory electricity at work regulations. Their statement now has a new ending, which reads... Installations to which BS 7671 is relevant may have been designed and installed in accordance with an earlier edition, now superseded, but then current. That in itself would not mean that the installation would fail to comply with the Electricity at Work Regulations 1989. Remember, if you kill someone or burn the place down, it's the HSE who will be bunging your ass into a jail cell with Bubba the Bastard and his mate Big I was going to say Clive, but that's not right. That shows what I've been watching on YouTube. Anyway, when it's the HSC themselves who are saying that older installations are permitted to exist without their continued use being a breach of EAWR, that's a fact you can bank. Sure, it falls foul of EAWR if, on your watch, you miss something dangerous on an older installation, just the same as if you miss something dangerous on a new installation. But older in of itself doesn't immediately mean dangerous and the HSE have been refreshingly clear about that on page 17. Fuck me, 624 pages in this book and I'm only on page 17? Well, don't worry, I'm not taking this in order. I'll be bouncing around the thing. Although if we do turn over to page 18, we get something else that's new. What is effectively a glossary of terms to decipher for us dumb proles on what the regulations really mean when they say something is required or recommended. This is an area Samira must have come in and interpreted because I can't be the only one who has apparently been reading things wrong over the past years. You see, required means you will do something. That's fair enough. And is the only normative element, whereas recommended means you should very much be doing something. However, that's informative and you remain free to not follow the recommendation if justified. My interpretation of recommendation was always, how easy is it? And will the client pay for it? As an example, you may recall that 18th edition introduced regulation 421.1.7, which recommended arc fault detection devices be installed, something to which we all largely said, fuck off, which is not terribly surprising considering the expense and lack of general availability of the bloody things. But apparently, the IET's use of the term recommended was their way of telling us to go out and bally well get the hell on with it. So who knew? It's obviously not just me who missed their meaning, because at the time of recording, I suspect me and Gaz at GSH Electrical are still well in the minority of those who have AFDDs installed in our own homes. And speaking of AFDDs, what's new with those in Amendment 2? For anyone still unfamiliar with the ARC fault detection device, it's a gadget installed in the consumer unit on a per-circuit basis that will pull the power if it detects electrical arcing in the circuit wiring. It will not detect arcing in appliances, at least not past any transformer or filter in the power supply, so your washing machine motor or arc welder won't set it off. It will work on ring circuits, albeit not on series arcs where a line or neutral has only one break, and it will not impress the lovely ladies down in my local when you boast about having such things installed in your consumer unit. I've had enough Carlsberg thrown into my face to know that one for a fact. I won't go into detail as to the ins and outs of these devices here as I have past videos showing them in action and how I installed them into my own very plastic, thank you very much, consumer unit. The big guns such as E5, Efix, John Ward, GSH, Sparky Ninja and so on all have informative videos from the past few years on AFDDs if you don't want to watch my ribald commentary on such. Incidentally, since installing mine at the Ascender 2020, I experienced my first AFDD trip a few days ago. I've no idea what caused it. It happened on the kitchen socket circuit as I was switching off the oven grill on an adjacent circuit, so that's odd. What interests me is that not long after the original installation, the upstairs heating circuit tripped off with an earth leakage fault when I operated a dicky switch on my kitchen coffee machine. It seems strange that the two trip events that I've encountered having installed these devices were both on adjacent circuits to what was being operated at the time. Might be coincidence, I've no idea and I can't replicate the faults. 
Is it possible that there can be some kind of influencing going on between adjacent modules installed together like this? I don't know. I'm just throwing it out there, see if anyone else has experienced the same sort of thing. But getting back on topic, there was talk around the draft for public comment of AFDDs being made mandatory or required, to use IET's parlance, in domestic installations for all circuits rated at 32 amps or under, which itself seemed faintly ridiculous considering most arc fault damage I come across is on electric shower isolators at 32 amps or over. Indeed, when I previously dicked around with an AFDD on camera, I couldn't get it to actuate unless it was on a load of a kilowatt or more, at least in the farty smelling atmosphere of my not exactly lab conditions test rig. Regular viewers may recall that in my shade browner video from February, I unzipped my somewhat unfeasibly hairy crystal balls to predict AFDDs would not be the big splash that 2020's draft for public comment threatened to unleash. Not least because many manufacturers still don't have them, wholesalers don't stock them in branch, and their price point hasn't shifted since the Wilex models I bought at the end of 2020 and what you can get from low cost brand CP fuse box today. A basic consumer unit upgrade to what the IET consider as the recommended standard should not be the sole preserve of the rich. And while prices remain prohibitive for the average working family getting rimmed for fuel, power and everything else in today's Titanic of Boris's Brexit Britain, low cost effective options such as RCBOs need to remain as a viable option for anyone who simply wants to upgrade from some nasty old fuse box to something safer without it breaking the bank. Whether AFDDs are considered hot or not by Jack Contractor and Jill Homeowner, they're still stuck in a catch-22 position where prices remain high and availability across brands and in store remains low. At least until we all start buying them. Which won't happen while prices remain high and availability across brands and in store remains low. There is some semblance of sanity and further clarity in the new book. Again, thank you Samira. And IET reined things back so 421.1.7 requires arc fault detection only for socket circuits not exceeding 32 amps for houses in multiple occupation, purpose-built student accommodation, care homes and higher risk residential buildings. That is, buildings over six storeys or 18 metres in height, whichever comes first. For everything else, the use of AFDDs is merely recommended, which previously meant you could simply ignore the bastard. But a recommendation apparently now means you should get the fuck on with installing it, which isn't going to happen while prices remain high and availability across brands and in-store remains low. Nonetheless, it's now on us as electrical contractors to waste the time of ourselves and our clients by extolling the virtues of AFDDs when pricing up a new consumer unit. Then, when the client tells us to piss off, to go price up an RCBO model so that we can simply get on with the job. Volume of sales will increase for AFDDs because of all the sites they are now required for, so we will start to see them become more commonplace and they should drop in price, although the current global chip shortage might prevent that from happening anytime soon. In my opinion, and I speak here as a man with nine individual ARM computers stuffed rather recoculously into my overpriced and proudly non-metallic consumer unit, I'm going to unzip, pop out and polish off my crystal balls once again to predict that AFDDs will have a future in our consumer units. However, I suspect a better use of the technology and lower cost economy of scale will be achieved if our humble CUs are equipped with a single centralised CPU which monitors multiple individual circuit ways rather than our shoehorning in separate standalone devices. I'm sure we're still some years away from that, but mark my words, the smart CU is ambling forth over the grey horizon, and it will undoubtedly talk to your mobile phone like everything else these days seemingly has to. Just what do you think you're doing, Dave? It'll also probably be liable to getting hacked by sneaky fucking Russians, if you don't pay a monthly subscription to the likes of Hager and NK for security updates, because that'll likely be a thing that happens too. Unless, in the meantime, we all get nuked by Russians. For me, I think the appearance of smart CUs will be where I finally cash out and go spend the rest of my days quietly stocking tins of beans, Marmite and Rubber Johnnies onto the shelves of Sainsbury's for a living. I'm not exactly a Luddite. I've been in the metaverse and made lots of interesting new friends. 
but a Wilex HAL 9000 or a Crabtree GLaDOS isn't something I ever intend to piss around with. But let's move on, this time to surge protection and the short, unloved and controversial life of Regulation 443.5. I have a video about this from three and a half years ago, after it made its debut in the 18th edition, and presumably some desk-bound nerd put all sorts of effort into authoring the thing as we were given a lightning flash density map along with a calculation for determining whether surge protection was needed or not. Unfortunately, that calculation was unworkable for all but those building wholly new housing estates, and only served to further detach the IET Officers Club from all us grunts squatting in a shared latrine out on the front line. All we want is a simple playing field levelling directive. SPD. To be or not to be. That is the fucking question. A flash density map and an unworkable calculation were a load of balls and the IET have seemingly recognised this and have pulled the rug out from under it. The Blue Book also had the woolly nonsense in 443.4 stating you shall fit an SPD, unless it's a single dwelling where the cost versus advantage wasn't justified, but it arguably always was. These days even grandma is likely to have a Wi-Fi router, flat screen TV, dab radio and a tablet so that her grandkids can FaceTime her once a year to say happy birthday without physically going around there and inhaling the overpowering smell of old age, obscure soap products and Werther's Originals. Nigel and I have been fitting SPDs since 2018 because it simply makes sense to do so. What was a 60 quid device four years ago is these days a 30-ish quid assembly and it largely runs a thankless task. It irons out spikes on the line which may damage your fancy TV or PlayStation 5, but you'd never know it. If you ran two alternative timelines, one living with an SPD and one without, the timeline without protection may experience more electronic device failures over a period of several years. It's one of those things whose efficacy is impossible to prove, but the science and technology is sound, and unlike AFDDs right now, the price is such that it's a no-brainer. Thankfully, Samira has rewritten 443.4 in the new brown book to offer clear guidance, which breaks down as SPDs. Fucking fit them. If you don't fit them, you need to get something in writing from the homeowner or duty holder accepting the consequences of their omission. If you fail to cover your arse in that way, you leave yourself open for anyone to come at you after a CU change, claiming their 2,000 quid Sony 4K TV was damaged by a transient spike and they demand you now cover the cost for omitting suitable protection. I don't know how that would play out, and may be impossible to prove, but it's now a real risk and puts the screws on budget installers who traditionally bought preloaded dual RCD boards from DIY stores without SPDs, as they were happy not to be blowing any extra pennies on whistles and bells, which is why me and former Fatso Nigel are often priced out of new consumer unit jobs by our competitors. Speaking of dual RCD or split load boards, before 2018 the headache of dual RCD consumer units had never been addressed and there was always an argument that they didn't comply with section 314 division of installation. You see, section 314 requires that every installation is divided into separate circuits so that the failure of one circuit won't affect another, they can be individually inspected and tested, Unwanted tripping and earth leakage is reduced, inconvenience and hazards are reduced, and it's less likely a circuit in the process of being maintained is accidentally re-energised. So that doesn't sit well on a dual RCD board, where you'd have a group of several circuits on a single point of failure. One individual circuit with an earth leakage fault of up to 30 milliamps would clock off the RCD and take out all the others. Same if you had two or more circuits whose collective earth leakage amounted to more than the 16 to 30 milliamp trip threshold of an RCD installed for additional protection. It all rather throws regulation 314 out of the window, like a medieval bucket of piss. Back and forth across the whole 10 year life of 17th edition from 2008 to 2018 went the arguments on many a forum between those who felt split load boards were a good cost versus performance compromise against those who defended the honour of Section 314 and all it stood for in circuit segregation. Then the Blue Book ambled up to the fight, somewhat drunk, ready to cause a bit of aggro, a urine streak already down its trouser leg, and wielding regulation 531.3.5.2, which notes, when it comes to RCDs, 
several circuits may be protected by the same device. And low dual RCD boards were legitimized to a certain extent and just in time to begin to be phased out as also introduced in the same edition was regulation 531.3.2 which required the designer to take into consideration subdivision of final circuits at least in residential premises with individual residual current protection or in not so many words the use of RCBOs although it never actually took the plunge into plain English and used so many words to mention such by name. Enter Samira with her red pen and bottle of Tipex once more, and although Amendment 2 still does not explicitly rule out dual RCD boards at this time, because 531.3.5.2 still has the caveat that several circuits can be protected by a single RCD device, 531.3.2 does now name RCBOs as the preferred method of protection, specifically to address the requirement of Section 314. How nice that Samira has backed up the intention of one regulation through a recommendation in another, when, for a decade over the life of 17th edition, the contradiction of dual RCD boards and Section 314 went entirely unacknowledged in this standard. My own view is that a Type A RCBO surge protected consumer unit is the minimum standard these days, and anyone asking me to install less can bugger right off. Type A RCBOs are a rather handy segue into, well, Type A residual current protection, funnily enough, because the IET are finally getting wise to what the likes of the Germans have known for years. Type A should be the default and not Type AC. Yes, until recently we backward Brits were largely and blissfully unaware of anything other than Type AC RCDs for additional protection. But when the blue book dropped in 2018, it introduced us all to regulation 531.3.3, informing us for the first time that different types of RCD do actually exist and for different applications. The trouble with the type AC flavor we all knew and loved is that any DC current leaking into circuit will saturate the RCD's coil and blind it to a true earth leakage event, thus preventing it from mechanically operating when it's supposed to. In this modern age, we all have a plethora of DC devices in our homes in applications that previously never used such. A common example is lighting. Years ago, the humble light bulb was naught but a simple resistive load. But with LED lighting now going in everywhere, modern lamps are very much more complex. And those LED elements themselves will be on the end of a DC conversion through circuitry, either in the lamp itself or an external driver. And it's not just lighting, DC electronics are in everything these days. While a Type AC RCD may be tripped up, if not tripped off, by a DC component, Type A RCD protection can withstand up to 6 milliamps of such dastardliness, and they are therefore better suited as being the entry level on modern electrical installations, something that's been known and adopted in Europe for a long time. Regulation 531.3.3 in the Blue Book nonetheless recognised Type AC RCDs and even had a note that read, for general purposes, Type AC RCDs may be used. Well, in the brown book, that statement has been flushed right around the U-bend, as 531.3.3 now permits Type AC residual current protection to only be used to serve fixed equipment where it is known that the load current contains no DC component. If you have a purely resistive load, such as a dumb old panel heater, you can shonk in a Type AC. For everything else, and that likely includes a modern programmable panel heater with a computerised interface, Type A is now the minimum requirement. Fortunately, manufacturers have largely been churning out Type A as the default for some time now, so any new RCDs behind the counter at the wholesaler are more likely to be Type A out of the box. Retrofit will be where things get rather more beastly, however, and new circuits going into older consumer units will likely see you needing to update the existing RCD in order for your new circuit to be compliant, if you can get the part, that is. If you can't, because the board's obsolete, then the pain of changing out the consumer unit or adding a subboard may come in, although the cheap cowboy competitors won't care and will do whatever they want to merely get something working, as always. Amendment 2 also now recognises BS7288, the socket outlets and fused units incorporating residual current protection, and lists it specifically in 531.3.4.1 and 531.3.6. 
You may find this a bit of an odd one, as these devices have been around for ages and come in rather handy where you want to provide localised residual current protection for an addition on a circuit that lacks an RCD at source. I don't have access to British standards, but word on the street is that BS7288 was considered as a supplementary protection and didn't meet the requirements for additional protection, meaning these devices should still have been on circuits with an RCD upstream, in which case, why would you bother fitting the fucking things? A recent amendment to BS7288, I hear, brings it into line with the basic expectations of any of us who've installed these devices in the past, that they're there to tick the additional protection box when additional protection isn't already present. Note too that BS7288 is not a European standard, so I don't know if we're chucking it into the book now as a bit of Brexit deharmonisation. If anyone knows any more on this, do please comment. Amendment 2 also changes how we test RCDs installed for additional protection. Before 18th edition, we had a simple regulation in 612.10, which merely required us to test the effectiveness of RCDs using suitable equipment, and thus a 1 times and 5 times type AC test would be applied and the results duly recorded. 18th edition introduced regulation 643.8, which said the same thing, but noted that effectiveness was deemed to have been verified when an RCD disconnects within 40 milliseconds when tested at a current equal or higher than five times its rated residual operating current, and it duly did away with one of the test result fields on the model schedule of test results, leaving only a single timing entry, which would contain the result of a one times test where an RCD is being used for fault protection, or the five times result for additional protection. All well and good. Except it wasn't. Installers soon found problems thanks to the pace of change in RCD design and the testing technology available to hand. New models and variants of RCD are being churned out, and not all of them are designed for the traditional 5 times test. Some instead trip at 250 mA, which has caught out the likes of Hager, whose RCDs were failing to trip in the allotted test time when a basic 150 mA 5 times test was being spaffed out of your tester. Hager's advice was to adjust your test instrument to perform a 250 milliamp test or a 5 times test at 50 milliamps instead of 30 milliamps, which should then see the result in the time expected. But not all instruments are capable of this adjustment, leaving many installers with no way to test the RCD they just installed to the requirements BS7671 was asking for, at least not unless they whizzed out and blew a fat wad of cash on some fancy new hardware. Needless to say, few were prepared to take such action, electricians being a stingy bunch at the best of times. Manufacturers and wholesalers were getting screamed at because the RCDs they were punting appeared to be faulty as instruments reported a fail of the five times test. And test instrument manufacturers were getting screamed at because many of their expensive MFTs didn't have firmware that supported tweaking the test parameters to suit the hardware being installed out in the world. Thankfully, Samira's level-headedness provides a way for us all to keep calm and carry on, and Regulation 643.8 in Amendment 2 now has a new note stating effectiveness of an RCD can be demonstrated where it disconnects within the time required on a one-times test. That, I'm sure we're all agreed on, should always work within parameters, regardless of any other ifs and buts. The letter of this regulation still only requires the test to be performed as a type AC, even if your tester has a type A function. But the five times test has been thrown under the bus, and it's the one times result recorded on the model schedule of test results for both additional and fault protection. For an RCD or RCBO complying with BSEN 61008 or BSEN 61009 and installed for additional protection at 30 milliamps, it should operate within 300 milliseconds, as was always the case. Of course, that's not to say any other RCD testing is to be ignored. If your RCD test instrument doesn't support the likes of type A, you should still upgrade so that you can test the type A function. You should also continue to perform the five times test according to the manufacturer's requirements. And if your tester isn't compatible with the brand of RCD you're using, maybe switch brands if you're not prepared to switch instruments. Remember, BS7671 is a minimum standard you should be working to, so just because it's only asking for a type AC one times result for the paperwork doesn't preclude you from performing a wider array of tests to verify the hardware is fully doing what it's supposed to be doing. Speaking of testing, the way we test insulation resistance has also changed, in a way. I say that 
because I'm sure many of us already work in this way. On initial verification, let's say on a lighting circuit where integrated fittings and a smart dimmer are later to be installed, after dragging in the cables on first fix, and long before you get to attach the shiny things, you would put temporary connections on at each point in order to get your dead test earth volt loop reading for the end of circuit, and you'd IR test at 500 volts, first between line and neutral, and then between live cores to the protective conductor. With no sensitive equipment connected, there's no reason not to test at 500 volts, and if nothing's been buggered up, the result should be nice and high. We all do that, right? Well, 643.3.3 has been updated so that you'd still do this, but after the sensitive electronic bits and bobs have been added, and before you energise anything, you would then IR test live cores with respect to the protective conductor at 250 volts. On an AC circuit, the minimum value for a pass on these tests is still 1 mega ohm as before, although new wiring shouldn't be reporting back anywhere near the minimum end of the scale, of course. Some equipment may skew an IR test if it has any kind of filtering or surge protection between live cores and earth, so certain items of equipment may have to remain wired out. Of course, all this was always a good idea, and anyone throwing in cables without testing ran the risk of finding something faulty when they came to second fix, which by that time it was all too late to do much about it without pulling down the plastering. I traditionally haven't used the 250 volt test much, I tend to test at 500 volts line neutral to earth, even with electronics connected, if the same potential is being applied to both line and neutral, then there's no potential difference between them, and no current will zap across anything still present. Whenever you connect a PAT tester to an appliance, this is exactly one of the tests it performs. I see people out there who are worried about undertaking a 500 volt IR test line neutral to earth on a circuit at the CU because they're worried about damaging something, then happily PAT testing the appliances that were plugged into it without a second thought. Speaking of testing and the filling in of fields on the schedule of test results, let's look at those and the wider model forms, various changes on which have appeared that affect how we complete the paperwork. There's not much to report on the minor works other than dedicated fields for listing the type, rating and operability of any AFDD and SPD, so that's just another couple of boxes to wearily type NA into on 99.6% of installations but bigger changes are in store for the electrical installation certificate when it comes to checklists. When authoring an electrical certificate on initial verification, the long checklist of items we would previously either tick as passed or confirm as being not applicable, ballooned from being a single page with 44 fields on the model form at the start of 17th edition to a two page 72 box bloater by the start of 18th edition. Those suffering from checkboxophobia can rest easy, however, as Amendment 2 has reduced all this to just 14 boxes. That's not to say we don't pay attention to all that was previously on the checklist, and four pages of items we all need to be considering when completing a certificate are given from page 515 to 518 in the brown book, but the difference now is that we award a tick or a not applicable for a collection of items rather than for individual items. Not everyone is happy with this, and on my last NICEIC inspection, my inspector, who I have to say knows his onions and always finds something to catch me out on, was lamenting the loss of the checklist on the certificate itself, as it serves to act as an aid memoir for the installer, and it offers specifics on what exactly has been passed or discounted as being irrelevant. From the point of view of an inspector, or the likes of the HSE, a detailed checklist means they can pick up on exactly where someone has perhaps erroneously missed something they shouldn't have, so the risk of reducing the checklist to a few headline categories means something may be forgotten about. Good Advice recommends the four pages from 515 to 518 be carried on the van to ensure familiarity with what is to be considered, and anyone who regularly authors certificates will likely already be well aware of what they should be looking over before giving any headline item a global thumbs up. I guess I'm in both camps. Years ago I said this was the way search should be. You don't need all those checklists, just someone signing the document to accept the liability for their work, and woe betide anyone who isn't diligent enough to know what they're signing off. Nonetheless, I didn't find the tick box schedule too much of a chore, as I use EasyCert, which templates the usual suspects for me, 
So all I have to do is run through and change anything that's off default for the installation I'm certifying. And I'm so familiar with these forms that it takes little time to whiz through a checklist. The kind of simplification being offered here only really benefits those still manually using pen and paper. Otherwise, software takes much of the pain out of the thing. Even if you don't want to subscribe to a certification package, you can pay per cert with the likes of Electroform or go knock up your own forms in Excel as I used to. Personally, I like the simpler certificate. Really, any electrical certificate could be reduced to something that simply reads, I've done the fucking job properly and I accept it's my ass if anyone can prove otherwise, without all the other whistles and bells. Because in the eyes of EAWR, this is the black and white that any signed certification always boils down to. The advantages of more complicated paperwork is that it provides granularity of detail, which aids someone such as an assessor to recognise something you may be commonly miscoding so that they can steer you right. The condition reporting form retains its checklist, as is right and proper, despite it desperately needing an overhaul of the items listed. But a couple of changes on that checklist is to visually verify the intake equipment, something we all do anyway, although now there's a box for it, and to group the DNO and supplier hardware into a single pass or fail outcome with confirmation that the person ordering the work, or the duty holder, has been informed of anything amiss. That's a good thing as it helps to prove where liability lies, although you'd have to evidence it of course, and the best way of doing that would be to have something either in writing or verbally recorded proving that you told the property owner, facilities manager or the person ordering the work of any concerns you have with the supplier's equipment that needs referring to the DNO. If I come across something iffy on site in relation to supplier equipment myself, I usually take the initiative and call them up to report it while collecting a reference number on the way, but technically it's not really my responsibility to do so. So long as I can prove I've informed whoever is responsible for the site electrical installation of my concerns and what they need to do about it, then the light is green, the trap is clean. One of the things I had the biggest beef about on the draft for public comment was the proposed change to the schedule of test results. So let's tentatively turn to page 530 and see what they've done here. Oh, fuck me. Fuck me. They've done what they threatened to do and split the bastard over two pages. I've bitched before about how I'd like to see the schedule laid out, and this isn't it. Schedule of circuit details? Fuck. I suppose that's meant to show basic information, perhaps more relevant to the likes of the clients and a job in maintenance bod. We've got circuit description, circuit way number, type of protected device. Uh, that, that sort of stuff's fair enough. It means page one can maybe be located near the CU or DB for quick reference. Page two contains the test details actual electricians will be interested in. But even if you think splitting it's a good idea, they've dropped the ball because the remarks column would have been better off on page one in place of some wank about braking capacity, conductor size, wiring type, and other such stuff that could be relegated to page two. Personally, I'd prefer all the information to be on one page, and there's no reason why it can't be. Flicking between pages out on site is a pain in the arse, especially if you only have access to old certs electronically, and you're fingering your gadget to scroll between pages trying to match circuit details with test results. And why the anal fuck have they put in a point served column? As stated in other videos, this is a dangerous waste of space and shouldn't be here. The definition of a point hasn't changed in part two, so it's still listed as a termination of the fixed wiring intended for the connection of current using equipment. I've been on installations where the number of points counted has been incorrect or has changed since the paperwork was completed because something was added or decommissioned in the intervening years. So relying on some of the nonces tally of points present may send one on a wild goose chase or cause one to be blasé about what points have been uncovered, resulting in something being missed. Even if we go by the definition of a point being something that uses current, that would mean a humble light switch is not counted. But what about an electronic LED dimmer, touch switch or smart switch? Well, they use current in their own right for their own internal circuitry, so are the point warriors counting the likes of those or not? This cocksucking column wasn't in the blue book, wasn't in the yellow book, it wasn't even in the fucking green book ten years ago, so why in the name of sanity is it appearing now? Although the old model forms lacked points served, many third-party certificates included it, not least EasyCert whose forms I use. 
An easy cert update in January 2021 finally shot the fucker in the head, although that was to make room for the then new AFDD checkbox field while keeping things on a single page. But if easy cert reintroduces this column when I update it to amendment two, I'll be going back to putting nothing more than a contemptuous dash into the bastard. It isn't worthy of my attention, my time of day, or the steam off my piss. This revised schedule of test results is a big disappointment, and just as we start thinking the IT are finally starting to apply some common sense for those of us who have to battle through their bollocks, they unleash this two-page ball ache upon us that'll have us all flicking between sheets of A4 or virtual pages on computer screens as we strive to both complete the thing or to view the detail of it. Installing RCBOs, as Amendment 2 encourages us to do, will see duplication of information entered for each individual circuit. This remains a prime example of a form designed by a committee of people whose day job doesn't involve them ever filling it out or referring to it for information. Even though this is just a model form, I know this is going to shit right onto the Dairy Lee triangles in my lunchbox because NICEIC will base their layout on this ill-thought nonsense and EasyCert will base their software on whatever NICEIC do. Yet there is no reason why the pertinent information couldn't fit onto one landscape page had they laid it out the way I currently complete my schedules. The only reason this mess will streak across two pages, like the massive skid mark the rough kids at my school used to apply across the inside of library books, is because there is duplication of information, redundant fields, and a lack of thought. Presumably, Samira was on leave when they had that meeting. But you know, it's the IET wiring regs and you expect some stupid shit to be in here. If it were perfect, they wouldn't be able to sell us all a new red book in however many months time. Moving on to labelling, and there's one positive and one negative to report. On the positive front, regulation 514.14, the two colours notice, is toast. That was another recommendation of mine in the DPC, and it's about goddamn time. Harmonisation to European wiring colours occurred way back in the 2004 Amendment 2 of the 2001 16th edition, so any warning notice regarding changes to wiring colours should have arguably been phased out by the time 17th edition landed in 2008, as by that time, any spark worth their salt working in the UK ought to fucking know what they were doing and how to identify the function of any given conductor. But no, they kept the two colour bollocks going right up until now, 18 years after its debut. For fuck's sake. This is the kind of thing an oik of my ilk ought not to have to report to the IET, as they are surely on the case when it comes to such nonsense, yes? Well anyway, along with the label, Appendix 7 detailing harmonisation has been expunged entirely. Ta-ta! Despite that welcome change, on the negative front I am most smo to see the inspection and testing label remains unaltered, as this was yet another nause I commented on during the DPC, and as a thing of such stupidity in of itself, it frankly beggars belief that it still exists to this day in this guise. There's no need for me to go into detail here, there's a whole video on the thing from just a few weeks ago where I go off on one about it. All new Appendix 11 is where the detail for notices now appears, and they've scaled down the required font size to match the real-world labels being churned out by manufacturers and label printers, down from Times New Roman fucking 48 point or whatever the shouty size was before. One change is that they now dictate the label colours, usually black text on a yellow or white background, and they offer guidance on font point size and style, which presumably is Samira once again influencing things for the better. Despite overall improvements on some notices, the scrapping of another, and their baffling intransigence when it comes to the inspection and testing label, and I guess Samira got blackballed at that meeting, Amendment 2 permits the most common notices to now be wholly omitted in domestic dwellings, thanks to a line added to Regulations 514.12.1 for the inspection and testing notice, 514.12.2 for the reworded yet still awkward as balls RCD test notice, and 514.16.1 for the presence of an SPD notice, which is interesting as no example notice is given and this was never a requirement before now. So that's a new regulation telling you to affix a notice, unless it's domestic and you can't be asked. 
I'm not sure I'm comfortable with omitting these. I recognise homeowners don't want to see utilitarian warning labels on equipment that was once consigned out of sight under the stairs, in the garage, or otherwise out of the eye line, but which now appears in hallways, WCs and utility rooms. But these labels, especially those on the left, are for the benefit of the homeowner. Sure, dump the two colours label as that's something aimed at an asshole with a screwdriver who should bloody well know better, but someone living with an electrical installation should arguably have a heads up that they're supposed to be pushing the test buttons of their devices and be aware of when the last inspection took place and when the next inspection is due. I would often hide such labels under the lid of a consumer unit, which I guess defeated the objective of them being there unless a homeowner, tenant or other interested party went probing for them, but at least they were there to be found. Notice that the wording applied to these three regulations permits the omission of these notices on initial verification. It does not mention periodic inspection. I presume that's an oversight and the inspection notice can remain unstickered following a domestic condition report and despite being listed specifically on item 4.10 of the EICR checklist, a missing RCD label can be marked as being not applicable. Otherwise, it's a bit strange if installers can emit stickers, but inspectors cannot. I think the idea now is that we rely less on labelling and more on handover information. So with that in mind, I've recently been busy producing my own handover guide for when I install new consumer units, which will, from this point forth, accompany the electrical certificate in any Part P cert. This guide, currently still a work in progress, contains the basic information the labels would convey, along with more detail on what the component parts do, the process for testing devices such as RCBOs, the checking of SPDs, and an overall troubleshooting guide. To be fair, this is probably something I should have authored years ago to accompany the verbal handover I've always given following such work. Oh, and uh, no, you, you can't have a copy. My superior paperwork is what puts me ahead of my competition. I'm afraid you'll have to come up with your own. This guide, along with the certificates, is advised to be kept safe by the homeowner as part of a service record for the property, similar to what they would have on their car. When they come to sell, rent, alter, maintain, extend or whatever, this information will prove invaluable, especially if kept updated over the forthcoming years. With such information to hand, any unsightly labelling local to the consumer unit is arguably redundant. Nonetheless, I still feel there's a place for some data on the CU itself, even if it is concealed under the lid, and for that reason I'll be pressing ahead with my one-size-fits-all labelling monster, as detailed a few videos ago. Whatever a duty holder may have received in a handover pack, I think it's important to have some basic blarney in place back at the board for tenants who may not have access to the handover information, for other electricians appointed to perform work without being given any past data, and for homeowners whose spouse traditionally handled that kind of thing, but who is sadly no longer with us. I have tweaked my own label design from 0.9 beta into version 1.0, and will be sending it off to the printers in due course. Thereafter, it'll be applied to any new consumer units or inspections I undertake. Doing this actually falls foul of regulation 514.9.2, which requires notices to comply with certain standards and with the font guidance and colours given in Appendix 11. However, seeing as we're permitted to omit the notices domestically, I doubt anyone much will care if I slap on one of my own design, even if it doesn't comply with what labels are supposed to look like. If you want a copy of my custom notice for your own reference, a link to my website is in the description. In this modern world, you can use an application such as Certon as a place to store documents in the cloud with QR codes applied at the consumer unit that anyone can scan. I have no experience of this, but I mention it here as an example of what the kids may be up to these days, although I remain an old dog incapable of learning new tricks myself. New to definitions is the somewhat wanky sounding term of prosumer an entity that can be both a producer and consumer of electrical energy. Ugh, right? Yeah, it's not the sexiest noun, and it wouldn't apply to somebody who has a backup generator, as that would be installed to operate as an alternative supply for short spells whenever the grid trips up. Instead, prosumers are assholes like me, with a PV system or other such form of local generation that operates in parallel with the grid. All new Chapter 82 talks of smart grid applications with a view to reducing reliance on energy imported from the grid through the use of prosumer electrical installations, or PEIs. 
New Regulation 822.1 suggests energy generated from renewable sources be coupled with a storage capacity within the installation to maximise self-consumption and to allow the installation to fall back into an island mode where the lights stay on if the grid goes dark. The concept of island mode is quite interesting because that wasn't a thing when I installed my PV system back in 2014. Indeed, to comply with G83, in the event of a power cut, my PV shuts down, even if the sun is shining onto my panels. Now, though, there seems to be steps afoot to start getting us all thinking more about decentralised power, reducing reliance on grid services, and doing our bit to backfeed into the grid our excess power for others to use. PEIs can be individual affairs, as my own solar PV system is, so long as you have at least one means of generating and or storing power and a management system for its operation. PEIs can also be shared, wherein individual prosumers each have their own generating and storage sets that are interconnected with a management system controlling the group, or they can be collective, that is where you'd have a single generating and storage set supplying multiple homes, flats or businesses. Such setups would be more intelligent than my dumb PV system of old, as they would incorporate a centralised electrical energy management system, or EEMS. This is a box of tricks that will manage production, distribution and connection to the grid, among other tasks. That's as much as I'm going to say on the whole prosumer thing for now, as I haven't fully wrapped my noggin around it, and in the short term at least, it's likely to have little impact on my day-to-day -day business, reluctant as I am to have any involvement in renewables. One change that may affect me when undertaking commercial work is the tweaking of Regulation 422.2, which now prohibits cables and equipment from being installed in protective escape routes, with the exception of those serving lighting and emergency systems, such as fire alarm call points. I've just put pricing together to run a new lighting supply from a DB in an office unit above the false ceiling and down the corridor to serve points in the reception area. I guess the question I need to find an answer to is, is this corridor a protected or unprotected escape route? There's no doubt it is an escape route, but is this corridor built in such a way so as to resist fire from neighbouring areas to aid evacuation? If it is, my wiring won't be welcome and I'll have to find another route. If working on commercial premises, that's something you're going to need an answer on before you can go happily slinging new cabling. Moving on from protected corridors to protective conductors, and there's been a change to 514.4.2, which previously stated that a green-yellow conductor was only to be used as a protective conductor, and in single core form, it was not permissible to be oversleeved at a termination for any other function. This has now been beefed up to also cover multi-core cables, so the green-yellow colour combination is now very much reserved for earthing only. While that may sound obvious, traditionally the green-yellow core has sometimes been used for other purposes, for example as a switched live return from a class 2 PIR sensor or thermostat. The worst culprits are perhaps found in central heating wiring centres, which are often wired in all sorts of weird and wonderful ways, and where you often can't trust any core colour to truly betray its real function. Oversleeving a green-yellow was never a good practice, but I'm sure we've all been caught out at some stage in the past. Time to stock up on some five core cable, perhaps. Speaking of core colours, functional earths which were cream or pink will now only be pink, and two core DC circuits changed from brown and grey to red and white for positive and negative, respectively. Three wire DC circuits changed from brown, blue, grey to red, blue, white. Section 701, Regulation 701.512.3 sees the permissible distance of a socket outlet from the boundary of a bath or shower drop from 3 metres to 2.5 metres. My understanding of the 3 metre thang was that it was to ensure the cord length of any average appliance would be unlikely to reach the watery basin you were busy fiddling with yourself in, so anyone intending on topping themselves by bunging the toaster into their bath water would be scuppered unless they had an extension lead. I'm not sure why there's been a reduction of half a metre. Presumably it helps in bedrooms where there's a bathing area that's not wholly partitioned off. I'm also not sure why the UK disallows socket outlets in bathrooms quite so vehemently when the rest of the world tends to cope. I'd imagine there's money to be made in bathroom socket outlets with inbuilt RCD protection at 10 milliamps. Such things do exist, so there's probably a market just waiting to be tapped. Tapped, get it? Tapped. Taps. It's 
it's because I was talking about bathrooms, see? <sighs> Moving on, and a change to table 52.3, not table 52.8 as erroneously shown on screen here, sees the minimum CSA of power circuits drop from 1.5 mil to one millimeter. Most people wouldn't notice that, but the reason it stands out for me is because in my early YouTube days, I used to get shouty comments along the lines of, you're an asshole, you know nothing, you're a shit electrician, and so forth. True though one or more of these statements may be, I said once, back in the mists of time, that you could run a socket outlet off a 1 mil cable, so long as it was suitably protected, for example by a 3 amp fuse. I was talking in relation to a specific job, that is, installing a TV booster in the attic where the only cabling to tap off is a 1 mil lighting circuit. This wasn't something I'd said arbitrarily. When I was at an FE college sitting the 2365, I recall the lecturer talking about cable protection and saying you could run a socket outlet off a 1 mil cable so long as the drop in CSA was protected locally against overload, as a 20 or 32 amp breaker back at the board wouldn't do it. Along came a detractor, one who chimed in rather snappily, although not abusively, with a few comments on other videos, who pointed out that this was incorrect, as table 52.3 gave a minimum CSA of 1.5mm for power circuits, 1mm was only for lighting circuits. And he was right, so I thanked him for it. I don't mind criticism, I don't mind being put right when I'm wrong. I'm not all-knowing like Sparky Ninja, I'm just a grunt trying to make sense of all this fucking stuff, same as most others. And if I say something outright incorrect, or if you have a different opinion or interpretation on anything I've bleated about, I'm happy to hear of it. If someone's just going to call me an asshole, then I'd prefer a reason to go with it. But these days, the only thing that gets my back up is some little bitch screaming because they want to help themselves to the information I've spent years stuffing into my head, handed over in these presentations in the space of minutes, and they don't like that I deliver it with the odd profanity. The fucking cocksuckers. So, seeing table 52.3 drop power circuits to 1mm is interesting. I don't know why they've done it. Maybe because the increase in smart technology is more likely to see devices that aren't lights in their own right be added to lighting circuits, perhaps? <laughs> you tell me. On the subject of lighting, and Section 714, Outdoor Lighting Installations, has Regulation 714.411.3.4, which requires an RCD for additional protection on lighting accessible to the public. That's gardens, kiosks, bus shelters, notice boards, advertising panels, and so on. You can think of this as Harvey's regulation, with reference to the little lad who was electrocuted in a pub garden in 2018. I made a video about that incident, and how the electrician got away with less jail time than the pub landlord, who were both sentenced a year ago almost to the day. That tragic event came about when a prick, who called himself an electrician, first fixed some class 1 lighting in a pub garden adjacent to metal railings that were themselves physically in contact with earth. The landlord, who was also a prick and claimed himself to be an electrician too, later hooked up those lights to a consumer unit with no RCDs that itself was wholly unearthed, as it later transpired it had been rigged to bypass the meter and no protective earth had been connected. The standard of workmanship with the lighting terminations was poor, with connections badly made and wrapped in tape. The metalwork of one fitting was exposed to live parts, and there was no primary or additional protection in place, so this poor kid, who was visiting the place with his parents, came into simultaneous touch contact with the live luminaire and earth railing, and was killed on the spot. While this regulatory change is of course welcome, it probably won't make any difference in cases like this, where the people involved in installing and commissioning electrics claim to be experts, have no idea of what they're doing, what their responsibilities are, and who simply don't care that a whole slew of regulations, as well as some law about not stealing electricity, were already flushed down the toilet before they would even have got to anything buried towards the back of the book that said RCD protection would be a good idea. Still, it's right and proper that this change is here. Personally, as I've said before, I would always try to use ELV for exterior lighting, such as garden spike lights and such. 12 or 24 volts isn't going to hurt anyone. Speaking of section 7, there are changes to the PV and EV sections, as well as some changes in things like medical locations. 
but I'm not in those markets. And the point of this vlog is to speak about the changes that affect my ordinary working day. So I have no further comment on areas I'm not familiar with for fear of saying something stupid. Sorry if that disappoints. The last point to cover is a potential bombshell on earthing, as one expectation of this amendment was their pressing for foundation electrodes, which would have been quite the ball ache considering it would require perhaps specialist sparks to be present at the beginning of major building work to ensure suitable earthing arrangements are made when the foundations are poured. I suspect that's linked to the whole prosumer thing and the island mode mentioned earlier, where an installation may be unlinked from the grid and yet continue operating. Few of us are on site when a builder pours the foundations, nor do we want to be. You can plan this thing into new house builds managed by big contractors, but smaller affairs would too often see us placed in a tricky position where the first thing we know about the project is when we're called in long after the foundations, walls and even the roof have been installed. On TN installations 411.4.2 recommends, which we now know means you bloody well ought to, install an earth, rod, tape, disc or whatever as an additional connection to earth and with it connected to the main earthing terminal. You're going to have to help me out with this because I'm not sure when this is supposed to apply. If I'm performing a rewire or a CU replacement on a property with a TNCS service, am I now expected to install an earth stake too? I know older installations with metallic gas or water pipes were also earthed in that sort of way via the bonding to those services, but I always thought connecting a ground stake to a TN supply was a no-no because if there was a pen fault, it would surely act as a neutral sink. Driving rods into the ground is a bad idea. That's why those installing electric vehicle chargers breathed a collective sigh of relief when the unicorn device was invented that could disconnect the supply in the event of a pen fault and save rods having to be hammered in everywhere. Whacking a rod into the ground risks hitting a service, especially if you're doing it at the source of supply, right where the fucking supplier's cable comes in. There are alternatives. JW has videos about the Condu disc, which would be less penetrative, but they only seem to be available from one source, and the price is enough to suck your balls up into your body. Neil Bridgman recently posted some pricing information on Twitter, and I've totally nicked it to show here, but you're looking at a good couple of hundred quid with that, and then you've got the labour to bury the thing and to make good. A poke around suggests some non-tool electrician saying it's not beyond the wit of your average spark to undertake installing something like this, but fuck off. If I tell my next consumer unit client that they need to fork out a three-figure sum for me to dig up their pansies to drop a metal frisbee under the ground, then I won't be getting the fucking job. Any localised earthing connection would be wholly impractical on many installations where there is no easy ground to get into because of tarmac, concrete slab work, brick driveways, or the source of the installation being in a central area of the house with no outside access. Take my own wanking den of shame where the source is internal. Even if I did get a cable to an outside wall without it looking like an eyesore internally, am I expected to dig up my tarmac or pluck out my wife's massive bush in order to drop in a conduit disc? And who the fuck's gonna make good? What the fuck do I know about groundworks? I've postcreted in the odd earth pit in my time, but that's about as much as I'm capable of. Don't get me wrong, this is a fine product, and on wholly new installations it may as well be bunged into the ground, but I'm not going to start shoving them in as a matter of course on your average 70s semi-detached. If the IET think I'm going to start breaking up concrete, relaying slab patios or sinking rods adjacent to where the power and gas services enter the building, then they can frankly bugger right off. Nigel and I are a one and a half man electrical band with failing knees, iffy backs and perpetual hangovers. We don't dig driveways. I don't get it, and maybe I've got the wrong end of the stick on the thing, but both the regs and the guidance I've had thus far from NICEIC don't do enough to explain why this is a recommendation and why I would bother going to the effort, expense and risk of complying. You tell me in the comments what this is all about, because this one's going to cause problems on the face of it, not least because the cowboy outfits who aren't monitored, because they're not accredited, simply won't comply. It's hard enough to compete without the expense of being expected to break out someone's block paving. BS7671 telling us to get the fuck on with installing AFDDs and other electrodes risks poisoning taking on CU work, because you get to the point where you just can't please everyone. The regs say these things should be installed. 
Your client doesn't want to fork out the equivalent cost of a family holiday on a Spanish island to pay for it. Your assessor berates you for not installing additional earthing. The client doesn't want their landscape patio pulled up. You manage to sink a rod without hitting the gas main, but the resistance is nowhere near the, probably, 20 ohm limit I presume it would have to meet. Speaking of that, I can't see anything in the book about the maximum resistance which would normally be 1,667 ohms for a TT installation with RCD protection, although under 200 ohms is the value considered as being stable. 702.410.3.4 says an electrode connected to the MET in a TN installation should be under 20 ohms, but that's in relation to pools and basins. No doubt, further clarification will be in Guidance Note 8, just so they can sell you another 30 quid book. But that's not even out until the end of May, so cheers. Mystery earth stakes aside, I would like to end on a positive note, and I'm pleased to see Samira's influence extends to better clarity of wording in many places. All new Appendix 13 on escape routes is a great example of this, as it takes the time to explain itself, what it's trying to achieve, and how to comply. This is rare in the regs, which usually launches into some poorly worded thou shalt instruction, which leaves you scratching your head as to quite how thou should. The new on-site guide and Guidance Note 3 have also been updated to reflect more real-world parameters, especially when it comes to inspection and testing. I think this is something we're all up for, greater use of plain English and real-world diagrammatic examples that we can relate to without feeling like the wiring regs are a, a thing that always has to somehow be translated. It's not there yet, but it's a step in the right direction. If the likes of IET, JPAL64 and BSI really do have electrical safety at heart when they author these publications, then it needs to be accessible to those on the coalface. Too many electrical installations are non-compliant at best or outright dangerous at worst through ignorance of what these books are trying to convey because there's a breakdown in communication between the information presented and the poor sod trying to interpret what it means. Those who find reading itself to be a tough chore at the best of times are perhaps particularly prone to finding BS7671 a barrier rather than a useful resource. Not everything needs a plain English explanation but there's no reason why the robots who can write this stuff can't have it assessed prior to publication by a human who can translate the worst of it. The brown books are, overall, an improvement, as is the all-new wipe clean cover, but please, pretty please, award Samira a pay rise and start her working now on the next red book. Crikey, it's taken some effort to piece this bollocks together. I'm spent. It's just the coffee shout-outs to tack on to the end now. Looks a lordy, that was a wordy video, wasn't it? Wasn't that a wordy video? I'm surprised if anybody got this far into the goddamn thing because that was over 12,000 words just in that one video. What did you think about it, Nigel? Was I there? <laughs> no, no, I did all the fucking work. <laughs> you did, you did nothing. <laughs> You've done nothing on this video except drink the coffee, which is why we're going to do our coffee shout outs now so uh, yeah. yes yes the the couple of hundred visual aids the uh, 12,000 words plus script the fact I've got to smell your farts in that cab of the van now and <laughs> now that, that, that's all on me <laughs> now I just got uh, face lurgy oh yeah I've got I've got a hole in the corner of me mouth it feels like every time we do one of these videos you've got some kind of <laughs> like, <laughs> menstrual <laughs> problem <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me laugh, it hurts. Okay, shout out a clock time. Oh. Let's start with the old Virgin list, shall we? Yes. yes. If you wouldn't wish to begin there, first name, if you can. Okay. See on my, I'm back on the uh, Cosmo communicator here. Dorian. Is that Willy or Wiley? That's definitely a Wiley. Thank you very <laughs> much, Dorian, and apologies. Thank you, for Dorian. Large calling you a Willy. Uh, speaking of things that rhyme with Willie, we got Chris Billy. Chris Billy. See Billy Electrical Services. Uh, yes. My mate Billy and his Western Power. Massive Willie. Yeah. Uh, who's been complaining yeah. about Western Power? Yes. Yeah, so apparently now their prices have gone up to two hundred and thirty-one pounds forty-two to install an isolator. That is messed up. Do you know last time up. we got Western Power to install an isolator? I can't remember. Never, and it's never going to happen. No one's going to pay that. No. Okay, we got Carl Robson. Thank you very much, Carl, and welcome to The Insanity. And uh, Karis Moyle, who has wished us good health in Welsh. 
So, uh, yakida, yakida, to you too. Uh, yakida. Karis. And thank you for uh, your contribution. Karis Moore, yes. Uh, moving on to the whores list and also wishing us uh, not good health this time, but a, a, a cheers, in, uh, this time in uh, a cheers. Gaelic tongue. Slansha. Slansha? Sounds Russian to me, but... You're supposed yeah, to say like... Stephen Sherry, that's his name. Oh, Stephen right. Sherry. Okay, Stephen Sherry. Slansha Stephen Sherry. Yes, and I'm sorry about Nigel's... Uh, 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 throttling of the Gaelic. Yes, yes, yes. Nerdy Chemist 1, ah, man, it ever build. Hmm, hmm. Thank you very yes, much. Yes, the number nerdy one chemist. nerdy chemist. Yes, and uh, yes, if you're not buying one strike filler, you ought to be. Yes, yep, yep. Mr. Humbug. Mr. Humbug. Is there ever a day when Mr. Humbug isn't on the list? Thank you again, Mr. No. Humbug. Uh, newly promoted. RD Electrical. Oh, well done, RD. Thank you, RD Electrical. Uh, Andy Payne again. Is, uh, like Mr. Humbug, there's always an Andy Payne. Yep. Sparky G. Is that Sparky G? Is Sparky G72. Is that the year you were born? A, a, another promotion to the Hawes list. Welcome yes, to the Hawes yes. list. Speaking of which, another promotion again is. Ah, oh, yes, Thomas Emmett, who I'm guessing is a fellow biker. Because, uh, well, he can. He's yes, congratulated. Me. Congratulations to Nige. On yes, becoming a two-wheeled menace. A similar yes, congratulations. Yes. I'll tell you what, I'm loving it. Loving being on a bike. Brilliant. Like, going back to my youth. Don't get him started. He doesn't shut the fuck up about <laughs> it. Similar congratulations from Chris Danseth. Yeah, cheers, Chris Danseth. Once again, yes, thank you, Chris. Uh, Jim Hook down in Sydney, Australia, who boasts that uh, they're only paying 12 pence per kilowatt hour, the equivalent of. Uh, I'm sure there. it'll come. Mm -hmm. Or more's the... Shame, yeah. Yes, I'm paying about three times that price at the moment. Yeah. Uh, you sent me an email, Jim. I'm sorry I haven't got back to you on that yet. So, uh, yeah, I'm hopelessly behind in my correspondence on everything to the point where uh, I, I just open my emails, look at them, and go, close them, and reach for the beer fridge. Nigel Tupman. Top Mania turning says oh, cheers. Oh. Thank you, Nigel, once again for your contribution. Uh, another new promotion here yes, yes, with yes. Uh, Mark Bassett Electric. Exit. Didn't we just have a Bassett? I oh, know that was a uh, an Emmett. <laughs> and speaking of Marks, uh, still anonymous yeah, because sure, for some on. reason um, anonymous Mark. <laughs> for some reason, uh, the buy me a coffee thing doesn't just doesn't like his name. Don't know why. <laughs> so it comes out anonymously. But uh, thank you, Mark. You know who you are. Uh, and he enjoyed our video on old testers. I'd like to say also a couple of extras, an honourable mention to John Bagley, who um, I met up with the other day. Thank you, John. Uh, we had a, a nice little chat. John used to work at Mercury, as did I. Uh, so we were bumming around the same offices at the start of the 1990s for a short time. We may have even bumped into each other at that point. Who knows? Not us. And I'd like to say a dishonourable mention to Christoph Kutch. Oh, right, yeah. Who chimed in on my Bobby and Robin video uh, with uh, clean your mouth out, vulgar and offensive language, which is a sign of low intelligence. If you were in my house, you would soon be out and banned from coming back. Well, get the fuck out of our house. Go on. <laughs> fuck <off. laughs> it, it, it amazes me uh, when we get these sort of correspondence how poorly written they are from someone who is complaining about our use of the or misuse perhaps of the English language especially when someone spells it as l-a-n-g-w-h-i-c-h it's he's written it as language <laughs> like a sandwich yeah so maybe don't go maybe, casting stones at maybe it was an caps. angry typing thing oh I'm disgusted didn't have caps lock on but uh, the only reason I mention him is because he then opened a Twitter account just to have a bit of a further pop and piped upon a couple of replies to other things, uh, one of which was, I think you should be penalised. He wants to do what to you? He wants to <laughs> penalise you. Didn't say... Sounds like uh, he fancies you a little bit. Didn't say quite how I should be penalised or yes, for yes, what, yes. other than using foul language. But it does strike me, you know, like, it's like turning up and invited to somebody's party and then loudly complaining to the host that you hate the music. It's like, <laughs> yeah. this is our channel. What we say into our camera and our microphone is down to us. Uh, no one fucking asked you here, you little Nazi fuck. So piss off elsewhere and fuck off. Because you, the trouble with YouTube is you can't say this in the comments. It just it, it excises comments that it yep. thinks are offensive. Yep. It go. I don't know how it works. I don't know how the algorithm works. 
certain keywords it just doesn't like. Sometimes it'll let an F word or a C word through and you think, well, how come that gets through? Yeah, if you type arsehole or penis or something like that, it goes and fucking just deletes it straight away. No, no notification, it's just like, no, I'm not printing that there. So uh, if you're leaving comments for us with certain words in, sometimes they get through, sometimes they won't. Nothing to do with us, we don't go deleting comments. It just, for some reason, YouTube has this ridiculous algorithm that, that blanks them out. But, Christoph, if you're going to come at me on fucking Twitter, my man, I'm going to fucking tear you a new verbal arsehole because <laughs> Twitter's got no restrictions and I'll fucking have you, mate. So, fuck you, Christoph. You're now on our shit list of people who are going to get it in the ass. <laughs> You'll be penalised. You will be penalised, you <laughs> little wanker. So, uh, yes, that's uh, that's it for this video. I fucking know what a long video it was. Yes, yes. Uh... What the Maybe. fuck I would you know. know about it, you bastard? I I I'm just here yet. at the end doing this, so I, I don't know. I don't care. I've still got about two days' work to do on it before it, it gets edited together. Thank you to everyone. I do appreciate it, even though I want nothing to do with these long, rambling rambling video. Yeah, do I. Maybe, just... maybe this will be the last one we do. <laughs> oh, my fucking mouth hurts. Well, it serves you right for sucking off little tramps like Christoph, doesn't it? Well, you have to be penalised. <laughs> <laughs> so long, folks. Bye. See you on the next one. <laughs>